We're live. We are live. We're good to go. Hi. Kia ora. Hi. Hi, Jace. Good Hi, for Pat. everyone to be in here. Uh, Alexandra McMillan, thank you for joining us. Now, whew, right, sorry, I was a bit taken aback by that one. Sometimes we jump live and I'm not quite sure what's going on. Um, welcome. Thanks for coming in. We are going to talk, I hope, a lot about climate change uh, maybe get a bit of an education from you on climate change today, perhaps, because you've just come from a lecture that you have delivered. That's right. But I was going to check with you, seeing that we both have children in the same class. Yeah. Did you have any kids off today in primary school level? No, no, I've just got that one. So just high school? Yeah. Well, that's all right So then. you had a few at home? I had two, two today. Yeah. yeah. Two primary schoolers at home on the on the thing, which is kind of cool. It's, it's yeah. It's we were trying to encourage them to come down to the lecture. Oh, the school? But, yeah. Because they, they're in exams at the moment. Do you always well, have any no, exams? No, no, the, the, the ones who are off for the strike. Oh, like the primary school kids? Yeah, yeah. The oh. primary school kids, the intermediate kids were probably more the target audience. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. There was one intermediate school child there, I think. Uh, but did they think being forced along by mum and dad? Yeah, or, yeah, uh, definitely brought along. They're never, they're never a good target group for a lecture, <laughs> the ones that are forced there. She waved, she was happy. I remember when she I was, was a kid being forced to go and see Kerry Takanoa. This is a terrible story. <laughs> Auckland to Maine, I was forced to go along. I didn't want to go along. So do you know what I did? Had my Walkman and Bobby Brown the whole time playing in my headphones whilst Kerry Takano was standing <laughs> on the stage. And were you bopping? Did you bop away? I can't actually remember. <laughs> I know, I was a little shit. Good and proper. Um, anyway, so yours, uh, they're in exams at the moment? Yes. High school age? Yeah. Is yours fretting as much as mine? Yeah, she has been a little bit stressed, but yeah. not too bad. Yesterday she um, she couldn't find her calculator before the maths exam. That was a bit it was a bit of a faff in the morning. Yeah, I took two of them to school yesterday, <laughs> and they were talking about sine cos tan, and I was going, oh, my God, I was fifth form. I can't remember any of that. And the trigonometry Soc and Pythagoras Soc theory. Soc and Soc yeah, that's Soc what I was saying. Soc I don't even yeah, remember. Soc but who knows what that means? Well, maths is like my favourite <laughs> subject. It was what I was strongest so at. So sine is uh, Socatoa, S-O-A-N. So sine equals opposite over adjacent angle. And uh, so toa, t op t tan adjacent over opposite. Toa, I'm just being show off now. There yeah, you, are, you, you see are. why he's a technical yeah, expert yeah. in this. And the looks, apparently. So that's Space good. For radio. <laughs> so we've got um, we've got children who are actually mates. Yeah, we which do. Which I didn't that's realize really nice. until we made the connection. Go to the same school, hang out on the weekend sometimes. Yeah. Like doing the well, my one likes doing the um, op shopping, and um, play yeah. some music together. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. Because what did yours play? She's a, a double bass player and a bagpipe player. Bagpipe. So there's two of them <laughs> that play the bagpipe. See, we're being very careful yeah, not to yeah. mention names. I do yeah, that as well. I don't yeah. use my kids' names in broadcasts. But there are two of them that play bagpipes, eh? Yeah, that's right. So yeah. cool. And there was an awards ceremony last year where the two of them led in all the other kids' bagpiping. They did. They piped them in. It was really nice. That's very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, that's enough of a family catch-up, I guess. <laughs> um your lecture today, now I'm actually going to look at it on my phone because I want to make sure I get the title correct because it's really interesting, the title of your lecture today. Bigger than the 1918 flu, tackling climate change this century's public health emergency. Well, it's actually mm. bigger than the 1918 flu, that's a question mark, i.e. Yeah. is it bigger yeah. than the 1918 flu? Um, you are a senior lecturer in environmental health, a co-convener of... I'm going to get this right. Order Tao. 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 New Zealand Climate and Health uh, Council. Um, why don't you give us a, you know, a background as to you, a smidge about what you're about, and obviously climate change is a huge part of what you do. But I'm also interested. There's a part of public health involved in this as well, which to me is a really yeah. new concept. Tying, obviously, tying in climate change to like people drowning because their islands have been washed away. That's a public health issue. But in it general, is. I've never really heard anyone tie the them together so much okay so can you maybe give us a bit of a background about you who you are what you're about and then let's chat yeah so um so i am australian and then i came to new zealand and went to medical school here and started out on the surgical training scheme so i was going to be wow. a, i was going to be an orthopedic surgeon um and then um uh got more and more interested in the links between um the things I was seeing in the hospital and the environment. So expand that. What, what so things were you seeing? Give us an it, example. So I was seeing a lot of um, road traffic injury, for right. example, and realising that the way we have put together our cities 
has totally set us up for that. So we've got this. The way we put together our cities sets up for things like road accidents. For road traffic the accidents. The environment right. we're building. We don't call them accidents. Okay, the environment we're building, because an accident implies no fault. Yeah, that's okay. right. So the environment we're building has a causation towards injuries. Yeah, not okay. just injury either. So we've got a few big public health um, issues in New Zealand, and many of them are set up by the way we've designed our cities. Um, and so I got really interested in that link between urban design and urban planning and, and people's health. Wow. And at the same time, I was really um, started to hear and be worried about climate change as, a, as, a, as an environmental problem. Um, and started to think about how how these um, environmental, uh, the physical environment is a kind of building block for health. So um, our well-being and survival as humans is really uh, dependent mm -hmm. on uh, not just how we design our cities, but how um, healthy our ecosystems are, things like fresh water and clean air, um, a safe climate, other species, that kind of thing, are really crucial to our health and well-being. So that's kind of like stepping right back from road traffic injuries, and yeah. that's what really um, drew me into into public health, which is all about um, instead of seeing one patient at a time in the hospital, starting to think about well, how do we prevent these things happening in the first place at a kind of population level or a community level? So is it in part kind of more holistic about? The whole environment, the place we live, the city, the town, the whatever, and how that contributes to the health of the people. Yeah, that's right. Bigger so picture. holistic is really right. Okay. So we're thinking not just about physical health as well, but about cultural well-being, um, mental well-being, yep. emotional well-being, economic well-being, environmental well-being. Wow, that's massive. It is. So, quite so how does that make you different? So, for example, you know there are classes and there are uh, lectures and degrees in things like urban planning. Yeah. Are you associated quite closely with those groups, and you take it from a, this is how the city could work well in its um, traffic flow, but this is how the city needs to work well in its mental health. Yeah. So, unfortunately, in the teaching of planning, uh, I think health is a little bit hidden. And so I don't, I haven't been involved very much in the teaching of planning, but certainly in the practice, in my practice and in my research, mm -hmm. I have a lot of um, relationships and collaboration with urban planners and transport planners. Yeah, for sure. So how does, I, mean, I don't want to get into you know, too fine details, but how can the way a city operates, down to maps, the layout of a city, how can that impact the health of people you know, what is the correlation yeah yeah um so so where public health started was actually in urban planning right. so those in the industrialization in the 1800s in in the in um england and europe and and in the u.s as well um what we had was this huge shift of people into the cities um to work in these terrible um occupational health disasters that were kind of mills and things like that in the cities and at the same time those same industries were pumping out air pollution they were pumping out water pollution and then um, the housing was really terrible mm -hmm. they're living in slum housing without fresh clean drinking water and not really any sanitation either so all of those really basic things about how you might fix that from an urban planning perspective how you might separate out dirty industry from where people live or how you might right. invest in in um, safer well-designed housing or how you might invest as a local government in um, just like the pipes for sanitation mm -hmm. things like that were really really crucial to public health right from its kind of birthing place if you like of modern public health in the 1800s and nowadays it's um there are still those issues um, of, of air pollution and still somewhat issues still around sanitation and things like that occasionally. Um, but much more it's about, um, so for example in New Zealand our urban design has been quite heavily influenced by the, the US. Right. Um, so we like our sprawling cities, we like to have it very spread out, we like to have our own big gardens. A quarter acre section. A quarter acre section in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. and. Um, 
and then we like to then we've designed it so that all the housing is over there and then all the workplaces are somewhere else and all the big strip malls we've designed in these kind of big strip malls for shopping and Mm -hmm. big um, shopping malls with huge amounts of car parking around them Um, and then we've we've not done a very good job at investing very heavily in things like public transport so trains and buses um, and we've created this um, system where people are essentially required to own and um, drive sometimes multiple cars in one household just to get their lives done Mm -hmm. whereas if you look at um, the design of of um, of other cities elsewhere, for instance, in Europe, um, it's been much more focused on a compact design with a mixture of housing and workplaces all together, um, and a good provision of kind of local services. Um, so is it? I mean, and good provision of public transport and much more walkable and cyclable. So that's all designed in right by the urban planners. So the, one of the difficulties, obviously, I, I moved to Dunedin from Auckland approaching four years ago, mm. and it's funny what you say. One of the big problems with public transport in Auckland has always been trying to fit infrastructure into a, a city that's already there, and it's basically impossible. I don't, I don't think they can ever fix that problem of it in Auckland because because you can't put a rail system in amongst where the houses are well, they, now. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, they they kind of did a not too bad a job at protecting some of those corridors, actually. So there are still quite a lot of protected corridors in Auckland where rail can still go. Um, and But it's a very yeah. radial city. Everything comes in. Like, if you live west and you want to go north, typically you have to go further west and north or come into the city and north. There's very little going directly from west to north or or even east to west. You go in and out. You know what I mean? It's a radial city. Yeah, but what it's I was also quite a long, thin, like it's on yeah, the it's isthmus true. and stuff. We could go into great detail about Auckland and Auckland's but the difficulties I, with Auckland. But what I was going to ask is that mm. also seems to be an area where every part of the city has its own you know, strip mall or whatever. So there is more of a localization of people. Like there are people who have never been south or people who never go to the shore because they live out west, is that a is that a is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because I think about now being in Dunedin, and in Dunedin we don't really have the strip malls. We have a central uh, street, and everyone and we've got South Dunedin. And everyone kind of comes into these areas, and it feels more like a place where we live and work together. Yeah, more, Dunedin more feels so. much more like a compact, walkable city. Yeah, it's totally. A very lovely little walk. Especially city. if you're not up in the hills. I mean, I mean, you know, the bu- and, and actually the buses through the kind of flat part of Dunedin, sort of from St. Clair through to Normanby, that sort of line straight through, are really good. They're like, and during the weekdays or every 10 minutes, my kids use them all the time and go into yeah, town. Yeah, now, yeah. But the other ways, not so good. Yeah, yeah. And lots of people complain about the buses in Dunedin, don't they? It's pretty... People say they're really expensive and they don't come well, often enough. I have to say... It's Dunedin's favourite pastime, complaining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where I live in Dunedin, the buses are good. Timings are good. Better than Auckland. Um, I don't know about the expense of them. The kids put them on those cards and you top them up every, every month or so or whatever. But um, but uh, So I'm thinking about Auckland being terrible for public transport but more localised, like there's a west and a north and an east and a south and a central. But then I'm thinking about Dunedin being a lot smaller and tighter and everyone coming to the same place for example to go shopping is one of those more ideal is one of those working better i think that i think that um it's about uh it's it's about mixed use and the usefulness of what's in your local area that's true um it's about having employment close to where people live um and then and then it's about provision of good public transport and what I think is interesting about Auckland over recent times is that they have tried to they've started to turn that around and um, things like the electrification of rail the improvements in rail services and they've really um, kind of shown that when you do that even you make small improvements you get big increases in usage so people really want to live in that way and what they what you were talking about in terms of there are some people who've never been out of their local area in Auckland. We're doing a bit of um, maybe not never, but you know, but you they, know they, they don't they go stuck, north very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, we've been doing some research about um, this this kind of r- the right to the city for especially for 
young people who are currently not in education, employment and training. So these are really disadvantaged young people. They've been disadvantaged by poverty and by poor education. And now they're being disadvantaged because they can't afford to run and own a car. And right. so they can't get out of their local neighborhood right. either to get work or education or more training are or even socializing or are you ever going to find that also the bigger the city the bigger the problems like because i think about Dunedin and you th- and you think about living close to where you're working kind of everywhere in a smaller city pretty much is living close to where you can work whereas in a bigger city i don't want to constantly talk about auckland yeah. let's talk about wellington if you live up in johnsonville for example and you've got to work in the city there's one way in it's quite a long way the bigger the city the more chance there is for that big travel for example to go and see your friends from east to west or to go to work whereas in a smaller city it's an it's an easier solution well i mean wellington does really well though hey on on public transport yeah. and, and walking um it, it still manages to maintain that kind of feel of a quite a compact walkable city even though it's a bit bigger than dunedin and you see um you see some big cities doing it really well you see um places like london even mm. who are, who are doing a really good job of providing um public transport um it's you know mixed in terms of how well they do kind of compact mixed use and things like that but on the whole they're doing a lot better than than some of our cities. Well, you think of the underground, you think about New York and stuff. Yeah, they've invested heavily and kept investing. Well, one that's interesting as well, what you put in place, I heard, I was listening to a podcast the other day talking about Los Angeles and the person who was in Los Angeles says, there is no public transport in Los Angeles. You're forced into a car. And then you get guys like Elon Musk coming along saying, well, let's build some tunnels under the city and shoot the cars along (laughs) on on, on sleds. And that's what they're looking at doing. So, the, their solution is not to get out of cars and not to fix up the no. public track. It's to get your car under the ground and shoot it on a sled to the other side of town. And actually, I mean, that was one of the very things I was talking about this afternoon in the lecture. Um, not about transport specifically, but about this idea that um, we uh, so so we are focused on fixing these problems mm. um, in the same way that we created them. So well, explain on that. So we so for example the Elon the Elon have Musk you seen that example. Sled? I have I've seen pictures of it. Good, bring that up so we can show <laughs> people who haven't seen it. Elon Musk, the absolute you know genius, you've got to say it, has decided that the solution to Los Angeles, uh, look up car sled, yeah that'll do, um, is to put cars on sleds, put them under the ground, and like fire them at hundreds of miles an hour across. This might be a we bring this up. This is probably they, and, and there's a there's a change. Okay, see those cars coming up on the right hand side. So you go into the you go onto the um, onto the sled. This is for real. This is not his, they're testing this at the moment. This is yes an animation, but it's for real. And you go down into an area, and you don't drive the car in the in the tunnel. You go down into these areas, and then you fire these sleds at enormous speeds <laughs> to the other side of town. It's like a rat race. It's amazing. So yeah, so now people know what we're talking about. If they but what seen do you reckon? Before. Like, how do you think that improves people's, I don't know, well-being and fairness and? You know, all I can think though. Sorry, sorry to be <laughs> a bit of a boy, the, but it's like really two hundred kilometers per hour. That looks fucking amazing. <laughs> but yes, okay. Let's now come back into the world. <laughs> oh, it's, it looks like the world's best slide. But let's come back sure. to the reality. So your question was, yeah, how does that fun. improve? Yeah, like it, looking at that, how does that? How is that going to contribute to improving okay, well, well-being? Use, so so using the example you just gave equity. about someone having um, wealth inequality where they can't even afford a car, yeah. that's obviously not yeah, the solution. That's right. So there'll be lots. So again, maybe that's a solution for those who can afford, but for those that can't, that doesn't help them get to the other side of town to get a job. And that's kind of, it's, um, yeah, so, so one of the things we were talking about this afternoon with climate change was how... Um, uh, how how often the solutions proposed are about continuing to uh, make a huge profit for the corporations who have been kind of part of creating the problem in the first place. And, mm-hmm. and I think, um, you know, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, um, biofuels, uh, what was the other example we used this afternoon? Um yeah, there was one one other example. They're all kind of like, how do we, how do we, how do we keep making money here? How do we keep within this current 
um, economic model um, and yet answer that one issue, so respond to that one so issue. So that one issue is, is like for those who who are less fortunate, lower socioeconomic, how do we include them? Is no, that the more main like, one issue? No, the issue that, that, that they're being required to address is how do we reduce emissions from transport? Right. And rather than saying, oh, well, let's look at a – let's look at all the other problems that the current way of doing transport causes and how do we how do we ha- find some find a um some solutions that that address all of those issues at mm. the same time there there's a focus on the single issue of climate change and reducing emissions while we carry on with the same model of doing things on the whole okay so we carry on with the same model we're not changing everything but we're giving lip service to how do we address this yeah. I've not, it's not what you've said yeah. but i'm trying to pretty think about much, it pretty much i mean so does that mean it's become like like i i'm reticent to show people this and so we're not going to do it yet i'm still thinking about it but when i started blogging 10 years ago one of the first pieces i ever wrote was talking about average joe on climate change i didn't really understand it yeah i had some thoughts around it i looked at the numbers and it felt to me that perhaps 10 years ago um, there was a bit of lip service being play, paid to climate change because there looked to be some easy solutions. For example, one of the examples I gave in this piece I wrote 10 years ago was why are hybrid cars 20% more expensive than their petrol yeah. counterpart? If we yeah. actually want to get yeah, people into really hybrids, serious. let's get a subsidy that makes them 20% cheaper mm. and then who wouldn't be in a hybrid? Mm, mm, that mm. that kind of, I guess I'm a bit of a pragmatist and I like to go, if this is a problem, and for example, the government wants to address it, or agencies want to address it, then let's look at ways to address it rather than keeping on saying we should address it. Like I think carbon credits, which seems to be a thing that's disappeared, but that seems to be a bit of a fallacy to me because it basically says I'm going to emit this carbon, but I'm going to pay for it, so it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah it'll so be fine. That idea I, I can still pollute, but yeah. it'll be fine because I've paid for it. In other words, I'm not going to stop polluting. I'm just going to pay for the polluting that I've done. I mean, am I wrong? I mean, you're the expert. I, I mean, what you're talking about are examples of trying to um, do, do exactly what I've been talking about, which is to say we want to carry on having this um, to having this neoliberal market capitalism. In other words, um, our focus is on the most profit. Yep. And um, so neoliberal meaning original liberal meaning basically far right. To not hear people say liberal as in the left. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 neoliberal, and um, and that means finding market solutions yep. to things like climate change and other kinds of big human problems mm-hmm. that we have. Um, but within a profit-driven model. Yeah, within that same yeah. market-driven model, and I th- I think it's um it's pretty clear that. That firstly, that's not going to be successful even for climate change, and mm-hmm. secondly, it doesn't help us to do the um, the more integrated thinking about well, 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 actually, this requirement to now do something about climate change also offers this massive opportunity to address a whole bunch of other problems that we've set up from the way that we've designed stuff at the moment. And is that when it comes back to? urban design and that kind of stuff as well those sorts of problems for example yeah yeah so so some of new zealand's biggest um public health problems are um obesity and heart disease Mm -hmm. and road traffic injury um air pollution is a bit of a problem Mm -hmm. not quite so much as in other big cities around the world um diabetes um and then how we do um healthy aging going into the future um all of those things um you know we have this opportunity this requirement for transformation to low carbon that provides a huge opportunity to try and bring those other things together and see if we can't um find some win-win solutions so let me ask you this let's bring up this ridiculous article i wrote 10 years ago that i'm slightly (laughs) embarrassed by now you have to understand that it is 10 years ago plus and i was really just starting my journey down this path so we can scroll past all that stuff because one of the points I was talking about was the amount of carbon that gets emitted in New Zealand, what we're responsible for as a, as a um, household, the hypocrisy of the government, for example, you know, they could subsidise hybrid cards. Why was solar so expensive? I think yeah, in yeah. Australia at the same time had a solar subsidy of five grand or something. But this is what I kind of came to and this is what I sort of still stand by today. Stand oh, by is the wrong word. Clear. 
Well, no, I don't know. Not even so much. I'm not a fan <laughs> of it. I, what I was doing was going, if this is the case, then this is the counter. This is where we need to go. You know, like people at that age were saying, if it is man made, and, you know, I accept completely that it's man made, there's a large contribu- contribution to man made. I'm not what they call a denier. But back then, uh, there was people saying, well, if it is man made, the solution is this. But the solution didn't go well with people who were saying it was man made. So we're not, we're not debating that point now. But the point I came to then, and I kind of have come back to over several times, including a little bit of uh, work with a couple of, of political parties about this idea, is rather than, and the reason it interests me is, it sounds like you're kind of talking about a main focus and a byproduct a little bit. Maybe, maybe not your words. More integration. Okay. Yeah. Whereas if we sold the idea about a war on pollution, mm then to me it would seem that a lot of those boxes of climate mm. change would be ticked. And because climate change seems to be a bit of a political football, it seems to be a, you know, one side says, we'll all be, I'm exaggerating, but we'll all be dead in 100 years, and the other side says, there's no evidence that man's causing this at all, it's cyclical, and we had volcanoes forever. Whereas if you said to every New Zealander, you know, would you like to breathe cleaner air? They'd go, Yep. Would you like to have cleaner streams? They'd yeah. go, yep. Would you like to have a more efficient, cheaper fuel for your vehicle? They'd go, yep. And so back then, 10 years ago when I was first looking at it, and something that I've kind of still, I don't want to say stood by like I'd die on this hill, but it's like if it was repackaged slightly and mm. we addressed it as looking at pollution, then and I'm going to use the word byproduct, a lot, if not all, of those climate change issues would probably be ticked as well. Mm. reducing cleaner waterways, reducing pollution in the year, you know, reducing fossil fuels are a lot of the key kind of factors it would seem to climate change. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's definitely one of the things that we've been trying to do is to reframe um, dealing with dealing with climate change. Um, so I think in New Zealand, the framing has been very strongly over time that climate change is an environmental issue. Mm-hmm. Um, climate change is scary, we, and we don't we're not really doing anything in New Zealand um, to cause the problem, um, and it's going to cost us a lot to do right. something about it. That, that's been the the focus of the framing over the last I don't know cost us a lot as so. individuals, our, ec- our economy and our households. Right. So, so our out of my back pocket and out of right. your back okay. pocket. Um, Whereas actually what we know is that firstly, climate change is a massive issue for human for humans and human well being and yeah. human survival. Just ask the people it's of Kiribati. Yeah, it's yeah. a human issue. Um, that that climate change um, is an opportunity. Um, climate action is an opportunity. When you say opportunity, you're are you talking as well marketable? Financial, yeah, it's an economic economic opportunity. opportunity. It's a health opportunity. I know that in America, one of the kind of jokes of the last election about you know I'm going to bring back coal mining jobs, which Trump was saying. Oh yeah, and then the uh, the 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 other side was saying we're creating seven green energy jobs every day for every one coal job that's leaving, sort of thing. So where would you put your economic opportunity into the growing industry or into the dying industry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could come back to the particular communities who are impacted mm. and helping them to adjust transition, but on the whole, exactly. And um, and that, that, yeah, climate change doesn't have to be a cost. It could be a benefit. Is it, that makes it sound an easy transition, though. I mean, no, could, could I it, don't, it's could not it be easy. A, no, it, could, it be a, could it be a cost to start off with that you get a back end from? So you as, might as, have to put an investment a, in. Yeah, as, a, as an example, exactly. if I put solder on my roof, there's a cost, but I might get that back over the next 10 yeah, years. Yeah. So there might be a, 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 a net gain, but there still may be an initial cost whether that is and that could probably talk about social as well cost initially um like for example the coal miners um there could be a lot of people out of work to start off with before other industries grow but i often think of my when my my dear old mum was around um, very very young they used to have the ice man coming to put the ice in the bottom mm. of the safe mm. and i always use the example what happened to the ice man when mm. refrigerators came along or he either uh, adapted and grew or he disappeared Mm. and to me that feels like perhaps fossil fuels and where fossil fuels are going 
people either need to adapt and grow or they disappear. They've disappeared forever. The Iceman That's right. no longer exists. And I think um, one of the, you know, one of the really successful things about humans is our adaptability. Yeah. And it's how we've been so successful over our whole history is our ability to adapt to a multitude of different circumstances and to adapt quite quickly. And, um, and I think by, I think by um, holding on to this model mm-hmm. that we're holding on to um, and the whole um, setup of things like protecting industries, mm-hmm. um, bailing out the car industry, for example, bailing out the banks, um, is, a, is, a, is, is a real barrier to that, um, that natural uh, successful adaptation that we do really well. And obviously there, there is this issue of um, who the winners are mm. and who the losers are and how we make sure that uh, how we make sure that we don't just keep um, shoring up the same winners and uh, and increase injustices. So under the current model, I'm using the word model as in how we're doing it at the moment, who are the winners and who are the losers? Well, so at the moment, um, what, we, what we've got is kind of grow, these growing income inequities, mm-hmm. don't we? We've got this, um, the growing wealth of the 1% who are often, you know, they're the CEOs of the multinational corporations and um, they're very, very rich. And then we have th- this increasing gap between the, ri- the, that, the rich and the poor. And, and we've got growing inequities, income inequities again in New Zealand as well, not just globally. So, um, so how we make sure that our transition um, reduces those inequities and doesn't make them worse and assists communities like coal mining communities to, to a transition that is fair mm-hmm. um, and doesn't leave a whole bunch of people newly in poverty, I think is, uh, that's really crucial. So actually when you do get a Trump type figure that says, I'll look after you coal miners, they go, Whew, I'm still going to be able to pay the mortgage, I'll vote for you. Yeah, he knows that that's yeah, of course. a way <laughs> Getting it's a good way of getting votes here too, you know. So, so the other, <laughs> the other thing to think about, and I'm, and you have, forgive me because I am hugely. When I say invested, I spend hours a day looking at political things. I love it. Mm. So a lot of these conversations, I think about the, you know, how it would sit politically, sort of thing. And some of the words you've just used about uh, wealth inequality, you know, the gap between rich and poor, uh, is often something that's criticised by the right, meaning. You know, why shouldn't, you know, Mark Zuckerberg be allowed to invent something that can make $100 billion sort of thing? Um, when we talk about this in this context, are we, how do we, how do we address the idea of people working hard, doing well for themselves, becoming a one percenter versus people living off the backs of the poor and, you know, raping society, for want of a better word? Yeah, so often those people are, are making their wealth out of, other people's poverty and out of environmental degradation, Mm. which is really linked with other people's poverty. Um, And that that you have, uh, and what we do have in New Zealand is a whole bunch of people working really, really hard and still not being able to put healthy food on the table, pay their rent. Um, Are these sorts of things, are these more easily defined if you put it, if you put an example to it, so for example, the American example perfectly is Walmart. The Walmart owners being yeah, worth thirty sure. billion or whatever, mm. and the Walmart workers having Not to get having government, a wage. Yeah, having to get government subsidy yeah. to survive, and then and then maybe even the Walmart owners not really paying their taxes so that the government can yeah, then yeah. turn around and support them. Yeah, you know, getting out of even the taxes that they are currently meant to pay, which is probably not enough. So, do you, you know? think, in theory, you can be an ethical one percenter? I've ne- I don't know. I've never really thought about that. Because uh, I mean, I, d- I don't think so. I don't, don't know. Re- honestly, I can't imagine it. I mean, uh, what about what's his name? James. His name eludes me. Not not Bill Gates, but the yeah. other guy that, oh, yeah. that talks about he doesn't pay enough tax. His name. You'd have uh, to give most of it. You'd have to give most of it to. You'd have to give most of it to. Um, 
Warren Buffett. That's the name I was Gov- thinking. Warren to, Buffett. To government who, who were working towards equity. Okay, so let's ask this. This is fascinating to me. And this <laughs> is not, this is not necessary. Well, I told about. you these things go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> this is fascinating to me. So I'm not saying you say you can't be an ethical one percenter, but you're struggling to kind of think how that would work. Yeah. Um, so what about the idea that both you and I sitting here are mm. one percenters on a world scale? Yeah, so yeah. we are the one percent. How, do, how does that work into the ethical yeah, one no, percenters? Yeah, no, I think that's a really, a really good point. That's a really good point. <laughs> so that means we're not, we're not ethical because we could sell houses or give a huge portion of our income away or go live somewhere where it does cost a dollar a day to survive, you know, quote unquote. Oh, that's very complicated. Oh, yeah, I mean, don't, we, don't get we, me wrong. First of, all, we, first of all, we live in a country context, don't yep, we? Yep. And so um, we, can, we can live ethically in that country context, can't we? And uh, we can work hard to ensure that the systems are set up to reduce inequities. Mm. Um, but doesn't that mean, in a country context, we can be wealthy? Um, I don't want to ask you in business, but but I, I own a house, right? And that makes me in this context. I mean, it'd be interesting to Google... You know, what does the one percent need in New Zealand? So they actually got a calculator here and it's saying, um, I've just typed in a random number, thirty thousand US, one adult means you are in the three point eight percent of the rewards richest. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So actually let me see if we can find New Zealand. But what I was gonna say is oh. we could um that's right, take your call. We're not it's only we're only live streaming and stuff at the moment, it's all good. Um we could always live more and i'll use the word generously yeah we could always not buy diamond pasta but get pam's pasta and do something else that money but do we and i'm not trying to trap you because i'm look my hands up for this as well right i'm on board with what you're saying i understand it but i'm like all of us could go so where is the line how can we say that a one percenter can't be ethical and i'm exaggerating you didn't say that but i'm now looking at this from a thing but we make choices every day where we are spending more than we need to how do we marry those things up I mean, it is all relative, isn't it? Yeah. This is not a black and white thing. And um, and I don't think that anyone's suggesting that everybody sh- should, like we have a communist state. Yeah. Um, but but what, what I think is clear is that the level of inequities that we have at the moment are, are not tenable with, with, um, with good well-being. Mm-hmm. So, so we're taking a step and back. That we all, we all, that we all should be doing something about that. So we're taking we're a step back, and we're, a- we're adding a context to this conversation now because we're talking about now in New Zealand and living ethically. So, how do we, in your opinion, address that that ethical gap between rich and poor sort of thing? Like, I'll, I'll ask you from me. Like, I I have more than I need. Um, I'm not wealthy on the scheme of you know massive amounts of money or income or anything like that but compared to many in New Zealand I've, I've got more probably than many if not most what what can we do to address that gap what can I do to address that gap in a more meaningful way I mean this is um, yeah I mean it, acknowledging that privilege is a really good start isn't it I'm a one percenter as it comes to the world no <laughs> acknowledging question acknowledging the privilege and um and certainly using your um, your vote and your privilege and your power to um, to firstly not argue against policies that might um, might uh, take money or so t- like increase your taxes, for mm. example. I heard a great um, quote in the you know, hit the, you in the pocket. There was a great quote in the last elections that said something: "If if if you have enough, vote." as if you don't or something else i'm butchering the quote but it's basically if you have enough yeah. vote on behalf of the people that don't right that's interesting so that yeah. it's interesting because there's two there seems to be two ways to vote one is you vote what's best for yourself yeah and if everyone votes what's best for themselves then that's democracy the other way is you vote what's best i'm not sure that that is democracy i don't think that i guess that's the m- definition not- of democracy was about you having to vote out of self-interest I guess that's not, I guess democracy is the wrong word. It's not my position, by the way, but it's, it's, that seems to be a majority rule, which is not always the best way to rule. The other one is vote what's best for the least in society mm. and because the most in society can, they're okay. 
Yeah, that's so. kind of um, like values. Based, yeah. values based voting and that yeah. I don't think definitions of democracy ever said anything about yeah how, okay how I, I used the wrong voted. word I par- I butchered the, the, the quote yeah. I think Jason took me down that line of butchering <laughs> something but you so know if, it's actually I think like, it just reminded me vaguely of the uh, the thesis that the, A Beautiful Mind was based on he had kind of like a uh, he has, has a thesis that the, the true story was based on was along the lines of um that if everybody goes for what's best for them, they kind of cancel each other out. But if they kind of all work together for the greater good, mm. then they can all get what they want. Right. I remember doing this exercise in a team building situation mm. and there was four teams in the corner and there was four different groups of coloured balls. And the exercise was to get as many of one colour balls back to your corner and you could take them from the middle or you could take them from the other people's. So, of course, everyone's stealing from each other and stealing from the middle. And then when, of course, you realise, well, if... I just take my corner just takes the red ones and your corner just takes the green ones and your corner just takes the yellow ones and your corner just takes the blue we can do this in like 10 seconds and there's <laughs> Everybody no effort. wins. Yeah. <laughs> because we just decide as a group which colors we have and that's the exercise over. I mean I think that um that idea of collectivism that was something else we were talking about today. We were just, you know, going off onto a brand new topic here but um was that one of the things they realized about this, the um, 1918 flu. So let's just take one step back and remind people. So the, the lecture today, which we're <laughs> going to start talking about, was bigger than the 1918 flu, question mark, tackling climate change this century's public health emergency. So the lecture today compared the 1980 flu and asked the question, is climate change this century's yeah, 1984. And yeah, yeah, yeah. we did a bit of research on it. And what was it, Jace? 25% of the world were affected by the flu and 50, 50 million died yeah, from the flu. 50 to 100 million uh, died, I think. F- 3 to 5% of the world's population at the yeah, time. Three and to 5%, about basically 25% yeah. of one in four people were infected. Yeah. Uh, so that means if we think about that, 25% of the world being affected by climate change. Is that the parallel we're drawing? And it was a bit, yeah, just not, we're not, I don't, I don't think going down that num- okay, the so numbers. Okay, so the specific numbers. Okay, but, yeah. but just in terms of the nuance of that, yep. those big numbers, um, of course, it was very uneven. It was very uneven between countries and it was very uneven within countries. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about inequities or, or these unjust structurally mediated inequalities in yep. other words they're avoidable they're mediated by the way we've set things up and they're not fair so i'm not talking about everybody being the same i'm talking about getting rid of some of these structurally mediated unjust inequalities and during the 1918 flu there was there were really big differences um between countries, between low-income and high-income countries. Um, low-income, I would assume, therefore, were affected worse. Worse, absolutely. Yeah, okay. And we, we, have, we, Why were, was we that? weren't even able to count the number of deaths. So that estimate, we, can, we, can, we have no way of knowing how many people died in, in Africa, for example, right. because there's just no, no data. Um, so so there, were, there were all kinds of things around poverty and poor housing and overcrowding. Um, and poor and poor health systems um, and poor general systems that meant that um, if you were poor, you were more likely to die. And there'll be a logistics in there as well. If you are poor, you don't have the same sanitary, the standard of housing. You know, there's probably yeah, more people sure. living in your house, easier to yeah. go through. If you're wealthy and living in a wealthy castle or something like that, you've got more space, more room, more cleanliness, more access to water, more likely to be able to stay stay um well from the flu yeah and so even in aotearoa new zealand the so the the mortality rate between um pakeha and maori was mm-hmm. incredibly different so it was we're still talking about in 1918 in the 1918 okay, flu yep. and what we know about um so what we know about climate change in terms of the scale, the global nature of it, um, the potential for devastating mortality and morbidity mm-hmm. um, is that, you know, we have these climate change scenarios um, and they the, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change sets these scenarios up. You know, what happens if we manage to keep within 1.5 degrees? What happens if we manage to keep within 2 degrees? What about 4 degrees? And then they have this kind of wor- a, a more worst-case scenario. What if we just carry on the right. way we are? 
and um one of the things that we showed was this lovely um, a picture from this lovely think piece from the New York Times called The Uninhabitable Earth, where, um, uh, uh, now I've forgotten his name. So as you could look well, that up, The well, Uninhabitable well, Earth. Fo- uh, Foster Wallace, David, here we go, you'll find it. You'll find it. It's amazing. Um, did this thought experiment, hmm. what does what does the worst scenario mean? Um and what it means is a lot of the major cities, the coastal major cities of the world being underwater. It means a lot of our food baskets in, around the world be, um, turning into deserts. Um, and, and both of those things put together make for a terrible picture of mass migration um, that becomes ungovernable. Mm-hmm. So when you put those things together, the kind of scale... Um, of potential devastation is very much, um, you know, it may well. Well, be let's see if we can. We can fix that, it you you said it was, was it the New York Times? Yeah. So look, New David, York, and David. look, New, just look up New York Times. The uninhabitable thought. The uninhabitable Earth. The uninhabitable Earth. And um, see if we can. See if we can find it. Um, it's and, in- and so, and actually, that's the trajectory that we're on at the moment because of our current inaction. So, emissions are still increasing. Yeah. Um, we're going on along that, along that worst case, worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. Dave, I, it might not be David Foster Wallace. It might be. Just take David Foster Wallace out. Just, <laughs> uninhab- just take the name out. Uninhabitable. Yeah. <laughs> See if we can find it. My spelling's terrible. It is <laughs> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Typing or switching cameras is terrible. <laughs> um, yeah. So the lecture today it was it was well received. Did you get a lot of uh, conversation at the end? Did you have like a Q and A? Yeah, we did have a bit of a Q and A. And you were here with a colleague. I was here with um, with my colleague and co convener of Water Tyre, um, Reese Jones, mm-hmm. um, and he's a he's a senior lecturer in um, in Hoorta Māori at the University of Auckland. Um, so, and we, we co-lead Order Tire together and have done for a number of years, yep. So, we, yep, we were talking together at, in the lecture about these things. And our message wasn't just dire hopelessness, obviously. We, we, we were talking about that scenario because of the potential and because we're on that scenario at this point. So the That's scenario... the trajectory we're the, on. The picture that you've just painted about our food baskets and about you know, our coastal cities, meaning the world. Globally, yeah. If we stay on the current... One of the things that I think people struggle with in this conversation is they go, oh, we've heard this all before. All yeah. the models that they showed us 10 years ago, they're all wrong. It just seems like a grab. And these, I mean, I worked as a talkback host for 10 years, so I've yeah, had this conversation a, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Where are we at? You know, in the 1970s, they said we were going into an ice age. Now they say we're going into a global warming. And they used to call it global oh, yeah, warming, but now they're calling it a, a, a climate change because it's not warming. These are the lines that come out. So what what can you tell us or explain to us that maybe helps people who have those kinds of positions as to where we're at because I guess what I'm saying and this is no disrespect to you or anyone sitting in front of me you just saying it doesn't mean that person's going to go oh light bulb moment it must all be true now yeah no so one of the um, I think that's a tough that's a one tough of the battle analogies as well that I, I like to use I mean I'm a doctor right mm-hmm. and you would expect that if you brought your child to your GP and they were sick um, and the doctor looked at them and they said, I think that this is what's wrong and um, this is the treatment that you need to have. Yeah. Um, that you would expect to trust, most people would expect to trust that. <laughs> there are some people who wouldn't trust it, but most people would expect to trust that, that level of training, expertise, evidence that goes sits behind that conversation yeah. and walk out or take part in a treatment in trusting that that all of what the doctor has said is based on solid evidence, right? Yeah. And um 
And the, the kind of evidence that does sit behind that is, um, you know, uh, but mostly a bunch of hopefully good research mm-hmm. um, and people who are not just doing one study at a time, but also looking across all the studies that have been done about that and then putting them together in a kind of package of best evidence. Yep. And that's like a gold standard um, review, if you like, mm-hmm. of, of all the evidence across all the studies and how well those studies were done and um, and uh, hopefully that there wasn't any um, uh, involvement of commercial interests in them and things like that. It wasn't just to have by the pharmaceutical company or whatever. Yep. And then put together advice based on that kind of gold standard review of the evidence. So what you're saying is trust the trust no, the science? Uh, no, so then moving across to to climate change, what we have is this this um, body of scientists who are doing a similar thing. Yeah. They are there are thousands of them around the world. And in fact it's kind of like that gold standard medical review only multiplied by a hundred. Right. So what we've got is thousands of scientists over time sifting through all this evidence building better models improving our understanding and in fact the models haven't really changed our estimates haven't really changed but they've got refined Mm -hmm. more refined and we found that some things are looking a bit worse than we thought and some things are looking a bit better than we thought and we're able to get a bit more nuanced about um where we might see initial um initially more snow followed by no snow at all you know we're getting a bit more refined about um geographically where things might look different from other places because of the way that uh ice works and the right. way that the weather works and the way the oceans are going to change so would you say that we have a better understanding of the projections today than perhaps 10 years ago of course we do yeah they're those models and that science they were building all the time on this body of this body of research this climate science going on all the time and being put together in these every six years these thousands of scientists around the world then sift through all that new evidence right and um, do this kind of gold standard review. It's, it's much better than, it's um, like I would feel like it was more reliable than if you went to your GP and they said, I think you've got this and I'm going to give you this prescription because I think it will make it better. It's probably, it's probably better, better, more reliable. So at what point, and I'm going to gi- gonna give you a silly example, okay, because these are the kinds of things that you hear. Um, at what point do we go... Because what people will respond to that is, oh, you know, at some stage, 99% of scientists thought the world was flat and they were wrong. So at what point do we go, this is, oh, maybe it's already happened, as certain as the world is not flat. And the other thing on that is if we are well past that, um, you know, in the last 12 months, I've heard words like tipping point. I've heard words like, you know, point of no return. Um, Basically, that we're getting to some kind of stage where we are beyond being able to reverse the current trajectory. Is that as you understand it? Is, is all hope almost lost? Are we getting near that point? Yeah, I mean, I think George Momb- Mombiot wrote something in The Guardian this morning like that, didn't he? Um, that was um, a bit like that. Um, so I think, yes, there are tipping points. There are tipping points, and I don't think we we fully understand all of those tipping points or exactly when they're going to happen, Yeah, you know, when... Um, the level of ice is, um, for example, is too low to then come back in the winter. Like I think there's there are there are uncertainties around mm-hmm. some of those tipping points, um, at, and certainly we we are getting close to some of those tipping points. And, and, it's, and, and, and do and we that's get ex- really? We're just looking at it. Do we get examples of like the Californian fires? I mean, it's interesting to see that people are pointing that towards climate change, the the drying of the area uh, as a direct correlation. Um, is that some of the tangible um, tipping point issues that are happening? Or, or I mean, do you see that as a link to climate change? Well, I California think there are a couple fires? of things, aren't there? There's the, there's the link with climate change. Mm. Um, and I might come back to that in a moment. Okay. And then there's the t- these tipping points. Right. And, and when we talk about tipping points, what we mean is that um, things have been going along in an equilibrium state, like the ice 
levels, for mm. example, in Antarctica or the Arctic. And then you put pressure on, on those systems and then they, they either manage to get, keep getting back to an equilibrium state or they go into a new state. They might go into a state of collapse or they might go into a bit of a state of collapse and then maybe manage to get back to an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. That's what we mean by tipping points, right. is, is tipping something into a new state that, that is in some ways irrevocable. Okay, okay. So, so maybe a revocable collapse of an ice sheet, for example, that, that we can't, that, that is, would be extremely difficult to come back from. Okay. And, and then there's this issue of attribution that you also talked about. So can we say that the California fires are due to climate change? Well, that's really difficult because we already had fires, didn't we? And yeah. California already had fires. But what we're seeing is that um, without we can compare a scenario with and without climate change and, and say that this severity of fires this regularity of fires um, was really unlikely without climate change. It was just really unlikely. And climate change has really massively increased the probability of those fires. Uh, and uh, so, so climate change, we can, we can then say that climate change has a responsibility for increasing the risk of, of those fires. Is that a little bit like, um, it's, <laughs> it seems very common at the moment that we hear about a one in 100 year storm. It seems that those are happening every three exactly, or four years. And exactly. that, hang on, if it's one in 100 years, why are, why are they happening every, every five years? years? Yeah. And I mean, we can also compare, go back to medicine again. Yep. And, and the way that we do studies about risk and risk factors. So this is all about probability, right? We're talking about probability. And if you think about, um, so the way we think about smoking, for example, mm -hmm. is that we, we did all these studies on smoking and lung cancer and found that, um, now I'm not going to remember the exact numbers, but that if you smoke a pack a day, your risk of lung cancer gets multiplied by a certain amount, right? It might be 10 times, it might be 50 times if you're also working with asbestos, for example. Right. And so that's a probability, right? That doesn't mean if you smoke, you're certain to get lung cancer. Sure. But nobody has a problem with saying smoking causes lung cancer. I was actually going to say to you, one of the analogies I've heard, you were talking about the scientists and the medicine all agreeing, is exactly for the climate change situation, is if, you know, for people who still think, you know, I don't, my, my grandfather smoked till he was 94, it never affected him, you know, if, if 99 out of 100 doctors saying smoking gives you lung cancer, why would you believe the one? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean that if you smoke, you're 100%. Yeah certain to get lung cancer but why, but why if but you wouldn't you're believe the one massively there increasing your risk to the point where you know it would be very silly not yeah. to do something about it and so that's what we're talking about if you here. wouldn't believe the one there why would you believe the one percent of scientists who probably still the people who people like ian wishart and leighton smith are constantly calling on why would you believe that one percent when we wouldn't believe the one percent saying smoking is great for you but but there's something else that's pretty special about that one percent who are still saying that and another good reason why we wouldn't believe them and that's because quite often when you when you follow those arguments back to their source they're quite often promulgated um, were put out into the public or seeded by the, f the fossil fuel industry. Right. So the very industry who has the most to lose by having, by having to take climate action. And it's becoming increasingly uh, clear that, that, you know, these two stories that we've been talking about, tobacco, we've been talking about smoking, and we've been talking about climate change, and we can put them together because... Uh, the two industries are Driven sharing a playbook yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> in yeah, yeah, terms yeah. of how they how they undermine um, healthy public policy mm. um, that that allows us to deal with these risks in a in a in a healthy and fair way for the for the population. Do you see a time where, bar the odd person, we are? all on board with the climate change I think that issue. time is now. Well, do you I think honestly, come, can, can, yeah, I be, yeah. can I be respectful and say, do you honestly believe that or is that the circles you're running in? No, if you... Um, I mean, you went and knocked on 100 doors in South Dunedin and asked them that question, are you saying 99 of them would say 
climate change man-made need to do something yeah i, th I think it would be pretty high oh experiment coming <laughs> <laughs> well uh, okay so, so they received so they so when when the government uh, put out their consultation document i know this is not everybody doesn't do yeah. these things so this is a, a poor possibly reflection on the on the general public but when the government put out its um consultation document on the zero carbon bill which is about to be before parliament for consideration they got a record number of submissions mm -hmm. on that and 97 percent of those submissions were in support of the strongest target and the strongest actions again with no disrespect to that process is that because in that situation there are more, and I'm not using the word activists in a bad way, but people who who are keen to support it, there are more people who want to support it who are active than people who are actively going, what a load of crap. Uh, well, I think there, there's a lot of active, um, there's a lot of uh, activity that doesn't support it. Activities. But and now we're back to almost the start of the conversation about what we're doing that doesn't support it, the activity. No, no, the, the um, sorry, activity to, the, to um, intentionally undermine, dismiss to undermine it. Okay. The, the zero capital. Okay, so listen, believe it or not, we've been talking for like an hour and 10, <laughs> flowing by, so much fun. Um, I don't want to hold you up here forever. I can keep talking. Let's wrap up. Um, I'm thinking about, for people listening right now and watching, um, as a doctor, as a person who obviously uh, kind of crosses that... Um, public health and the effects that climate change can have on improving our public health mm. what's a couple of things you can give us to think about to even implement that people in their own little property in their own little house can do or can begin to help them as individuals go down that path yeah and i think that we talked a lot about that in the lecture today and um some of the things we talked about were that um, yes, individuals, Fano households can can do individual things, and they're things like to to reduce their climate pollution, mm -hmm. um, including things like getting out of your car in the trip to work and walking or biking or taking public transport, um, eating less meat, um, because we know that livestock is a huge contributor. Right. Um, uh, insulating your house and using low carbon heating, mm -hmm. for example, in your house. Um, but th th those and that those individual and household things really add up and make a difference. Um, but but they become even more powerful when you try and do them, and then you hit some of these barriers that you talked about right at the beginning, like solar panels are really <laughs> expensive. Yeah. Um, I can't cycle to work because it's too bloody dangerous. You know those kinds of barriers, and don't stop there. That that you talk about those barriers, and that you get together with other people who can't do things because of those barriers, and then you press for those barriers to be taken away. So by press, that might mean public action, it get involved mean, in a group, yep. a lobby, your yep. local write politician, write to your local MP, yep. get involved in local in the local council, um, and then all of those citizenship things that you do, like um, voting and getting involved in um, policy and having a say on policy are really really important so so pressing for that that for climate action that is really um going to benefit health and fairness when you is, when you, really you say voting it seems to me that um obviously you think about voting on climate change you think more further to the left in new zealand as a as a whole the whole political spectrum compared to the rest of the world are we are our parties in a better position than some like i'm thinking about or is national really go in the wrong direction and if you have a vote for climate change it's going to be towards the left well i think that's certainly been the case in the more recent elections but but i think what we can't have is um this kind of flip-flopping between elections around climate policy what we absolutely have to have is a as a long-term policy certainty around a direction towards a transformation towards zero mm -hmm. carbon that's healthy and fair and that means in, that means engaging in cross-party agreement, which they managed to do in the UK. We haven't, we haven't, we're not there yet. I think there's a lot of work to be done. If you're an, a national party voter and concerned about these things, then then absolutely talking to um, 
your local, your your national MPs about how why this is concerning to you and what you want to see happen for health and fairness. Has the country improved? Like I was that that ridiculous article I wrote ten years ago, or post I should say. I think the number was um, this was two thousand and eight that Labor wanted to reduce the emissions by twenty five percent by twenty twenty. It's eighteen months away, less than eighteen months mm. away, twenty twenty. Uh, and, and national was 50% by 2050. That I think that was the numbers. Uh, have we reduced emissions over the last 10 years in New Zealand? Are we on track for that? Or is this a, a thing of, we said right back at the start, I used the term lip service, you didn't, but is this a situation where they've been talking about it, but there's still nothing really happening? Yeah, well, we're, our emissions are still going up, so... So that would be the opposite of reduction. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and so we're going to have to turn them around pretty quickly. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, there are some good news stories. So the last of the previous government made the biggest investment that, that, that New Zealand, any New Zealand government has ever made in cycling infrastructure, for right. example. That was a national government. And that was really um, based around uh, these powerful arguments about not just talking about climate change, but as you say, this is about making things healthier and people's lives more yeah, flourishing. Yeah, because, because respectfully to that decision, that was more John Key's cycle lane through the whole country rather than helping people get from Wakari to the CBD, oh, wasn't no, it? Oh, no, I don't think so. It was it was very much framed in the news. If you look up um, Jerry Brownlee's announcement okay. of that of that um, that uh, initial big spend that they made, they were going to make. So there was urban he development He was there. talking about, um, yeah, getting people right. out of their cars and onto their bikes to get to work and Jim how that Bally was going was to be good for people's health and <laughs> as well as the environment the and the economy, you know. So, you know, there isn't, it's not by any means there hasn't been no action, but right. we need to really step up. It is interesting, though, that, as we've just pointed out, in 2020 is an election year in New Zealand that both governments both parties major parties have made promises and i hopefully i won't be the only one talking to i guess it's going to be jacinda still of that day going come on you were under helen when these promises were made mm. auntie helen what's what's happening how are we doing it this, mm. this is just all lip service it's mm. going to be a valid question for that election cycle yeah yeah no for sure especially given jacinda Ardern's own commitments around climate change you know, she said, "This is our, this is my generation's nuclear-free moment." So it'll be really wow. good to hold her to some of those yeah. commitments. Hey, thank you for coming in. Thank before you. We, before we go, I, I just I have to show this cartoon. Oh, timeline of sure, sure, sure. It's sure. Uh, it's a it's just something I always throw in the face of anybody that uh, that says it's it's a cycle. Oh, yeah. It's a, if you're not familiar with XKCD, it's a mm. great online comic. But yeah. this, I'm just going to bring this up on the screen. You know that reveals you as a complete nerd. <laughs> well, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, uh, I don't I don't go to it often, but I, I, I'm aware that was a badge of honor. But it's just it's just great because um, as you can see on the screen here, this is scrolling down, and the dotted line to the left is is the uh, average temperature on the globe. And as mm. you can see, this is 15,000 BC going up, slowly going up, going up, goes down a little bit, goes up. And it's slowly going up, and this, you know, we're still 5000 BC here, scrolling through, you know, Pompeii, everything like that. And then we get to wow. 2000, 2100, mm. and this is a projected and see how much of a spike yeah, it is and so how short a time. So, yeah, yeah. People can't really deny that fact. So, um, optimistic scenario there it still puts us, it's interesting actually when you show that whole line, if that is accurate, I'm assuming it is, that, that, um, is still pretty massively increased from what the natural progression seems to have been. Yeah, well, there are some locked-in changes. There, there are definitely some locked-in changes that we're going to have to adapt to, and I think, um, yeah, working on that, on resilience and adapting to those changes is also a big task, not just reducing emissions. Yeah. I saw an article uh, year, last week, I think it was, and it says that um, no matter what we do, as you say, there is um, it takes, you know, 10... 20, 30, 100 years for what we do to slow down and reverse itself. Wow. So if we stopped right now, it would still take 50, 60 years for us to see the effects of that. But in fact, um, yeah, no, so one of the cool things about methane, everyone talks about methane being this short-lived gas so we don't have to do anything about it, but actually that provides us with a huge opportunity to see more rapid um, if we can get methane down quickly, that means Stop that, the cows that from we can, yeah, or shift from cows altogether, even better. <laughs> to crickets. <laughs> yeah. Cricket flower is the way forward. 
<laughs> so they say. Yeah, it's I not bad know. actually. All right. Cool. Hey, I think I think that we've kept you Thank far you. longer than we're going to, Doctor Alexandra McMillan. Uh, if people want to know more about what you're into, what you're doing, a uh, good website for them to visit would be ordertile.org.nz. I think we've had that up underneath yeah, you so. as a, as part of your. Um, Chiron, as we say in the biz, speaking about nerds. Hey, thank you. That was fun. Thank you. I think we good. both have to get back now to yeah. a couple of 14 year olds who are studying yes. for more exams tomorrow, probably panicked out of their trees. Hopefully, not too much. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank in. you. Thanks right. a lot.